Now, let me introduce our first speaker, Giacomo Parrinello. Giacomo Parrinello is Assistant Professor of Environmental History at the Center for History at St. Paul, Paris. He's the author of Fault Lines, Earthquakes and Urbanism in Modern Italy, published in 2015. He is currently writing a second book on the history of the Po River Basin from the early 19th to the late 20th century. And this is also principal investigator of the project Shifting Shores, an environmental history of morphological change in Mediterranean river deltas over the 20th century. And the title of his presentation is uh, Water as Infrastructure and the Scalar Mismatch, Po River Basin, 19th century. Professor Barinello, the floor is yours. Grazie Giacomo, thank you very much Giacomo. And, um, uh, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we do. And do you hear me fine? Perfectly. Excellent. OK, I'll, let me just start my time. So I'm sure I stick to the 30 minutes that are allotted to me. Uh, so hello, uh, many thanks first of all to the organizers for this invitation uh, and congratulations on putting together such a wonderful set of panels and congratulations to the presenters uh, for the great presentations this morning. I'm really sorry I could not join you yesterday. I, I had teaching obligations uh, and I'm really happy that I could stay with you this morning and I will stay to the end of the conference. Um, I will talk about water as infrastructure um, and the scalar mismatch, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But let me first begin with a very short story. In 2003, during the same heat wave that killed tens of thousands across Europe, I'm sure you all remember that summer, um, Northern Italy, which uh, largely corresponds to the basin of the Po River, not entirely, of course, but as you can see here, a huge chunk of it, um, experienced one of the worst drought in recorded history. This drought had a series of cascading impacts. Farming obviously suffered, uh, especially given its dependence on summer irrigation. Uh, upstream farmers in particular conflicted with downstream farmers uh, towards the delta, especially because in the delta farmers were experiencing an unprecedented intrusion of salt water due to the very low discharge of the Po. These conflicts, in turn, generated pressure on hydroelectric power production um, to release water from hydroelectric reservoirs uh, and lakes upstream. However, energy producers uh, opposed uh, to those requests that precisely due to the heat wave, energy consumption was at historic heights and it was not possible to lower energy generation in a moment when air conditioning energy consumption was uh, at a peak. Mayors on the municipalities around the major uh, subalpine lakes, on their hand, uh, lamented uh, that lowering the level of the lakes would uh, damage tourism during the summer season, which is, uh, of course, a strategic period for tourism. Now, this, uh, this episode, this 2003 episode, like the many more that have followed since then, uh, reveals starkly something that we readily, perhaps too readily, forget. That is how much the physical infrastructure on which social and economic life depends is tied to water. Water is an indispensable, indispensable part of the infrastructure of uh, agricultural production, of energy production, uh, and urban water supply as much as pipes, cables, and concrete. Without water, uh, this agricultural, energy, and urban infrastructure could just not exist or operate. In a very practical sense, and for the purpose of the multiple economic and social activities that depend on it, water is infrastructure. But obviously, it's also much more than just that. From the perspective put forward by envirotechnical scholars like Sarah Pritchard and others, infrastructure is neither natural nor technological. It's in itself a hybrid configuration of environment and technology, in which the environment is always an active part. 
In using the phrase water as infrastructure, I adopt this perspective and I draw more directly on Ashley Carse's important article, uh, Nature as Infrastructure. In his piece devoted to the Panama Canal and its watershed, Carse was not interested in ideas such as ecosystem services or natural capital. It, it was not about that. His aim was instead to interrogate how historical actors have included certain natural processes into infrastructure, into infrastructure building and into infrastructure management, or excluded them. So which they have included and which they have excluded and which consequences did these inclusions and exclusions have? So here the phrase water as infrastructure similarly aim at bringing into focus the way in which water has been incorporated uh, into infrastructure with a specific focus on hydraulic infrastructure of agriculture and energy production. Making water into infrastructure is a matter of scales. To make water function as part of infrastructure, water needs to be predictable, controlled. This is, is common sense that there's no energy generation in a hydroelectric plant uh, without the right amount of water flowing into it from a, light, from a lake or from a river. Water in a river or a lake, however, depends at the same time on local, regional, continental, and planetary processes. It also depends on processes occurring at multiple temporal scales, the season, the year, the decades, the centuries, the millions of years. To put it simply, these scales, both spatial and temporal, are not coextensive with the scales of infrastructure. This is one fundamental meaning of the phrase scalar mismatch, a phrase that I borrow from geographers like Nathan Seary, who have thought and written extensively about scales. Issues of scales are sometimes implicit in Envirotech literature, such as Ashley Carson's article that I was mentioning before. I believe we would gain at making them more explicit, at putting them uh, to the forefront of the analysis. The history of hydraulic infrastructure is constantly marked by efforts at filling gaps between the scales of water systems and the scale of infrastructure. Predictability, and thus water knowledge, is at the center of these efforts. This history, I believe, can also be characterized by the persistent difficulty at matching the scales and failing at prediction. Uh, is an example of what Deborah Cohen in her book on climate calls a history of scaling, but a scaling that ultimately remains elusive. I do investigate these issues in uh, the basin of the Po River, the same basin that I evoked earlier in my story about the drought in 2003. I'm writing a book uh, on this major European watershed, as Giacomo kindly mentioned, uh, in which I look at the transformation of this river system at the crossroad of making a capitalist economy and building a modern state across the 19th and 20th century. There is a mic open. I don't know who that is. I'm interested in how capitalism and the state contribute to remaking the river basin with water infrastructure, dams, canals, embankments, drainage works, but also how state and capital depended in very important way, ways on water infrastructure itself. Irrigation canals and drainage works enabled the rise of a capitalist agriculture in the plain. Hydroelectric energy powered the industrial takeoff of the region. Flood security infrastructure and water governance structured entire branches of state administration and law and tested repeatedly their legitimacy. Questions of predictability and scalar mismatch are an important part of the history of capital, the state, and water uh, in the basin, although they're not the only part. It's not all that there is to the story, nor all that I'm talking about in the book, but um, they're important part, and what I will say today draws on, on this project. And in what follows, I will first focus on water knowledge mobilized in agricultural infrastructure in the 19th century, and then in a second section, 
uh, energy infrastructure in the 20th century before discussing more recent uh, crisis of scalar mismatch in a third uh, and conclusive section. So at the turn of the 19th century, the lower basin of the Po is uh, home to one of the wealthiest agricultures of Europe. It is uh, an advanced system, it was an advanced system based on the close integration of farming and livestock, including the transformation of dairy products, milk, butter, cheese. This integrated farming system, as uh, Arthur Young uh, in such a short but very weak sentence uh, summarized, was possible only through intensive irrigation. For instance, Irrigation allowed fresh fodder year-round, even during the winter, which in turn fed a large and well-nourished cow, cow population, cattle, uh, that sustained dairy production at particularly significant uh, rates and quality, and in turn generated high amounts of manure. Farmland had expanded over the centuries by occupying wetlands and floodplains, uh, and there are very fine histories of that, uh, and depended as well on protection from flooding, mostly through embankments. To operate and function, irrigation and flood protection infrastructure involved specific understanding of hydrological processes at specific scales. Uh, Flood protection infrastructure needs to work with water as much as against it. Uh, the main purpose of an embankment, uh, as you all know, is containing the flow of water. And to do that, one just needs to know how high water can get, of course. Um, up to the 19th century, uh, and actually well into that, the main strategy, although not the only one, but the main strategy to do that was by using past flood crests. Embankments had to be higher than the highest recorded class, uh, crest. Here history worked as an absolute reference and the temporal scale of hydrological processes spanned as many centuries as the historical record allowed including. The spatial scale conversely included the section of the river to enclose within embankments. What happened upstream or downstream of a large river was typically out of sight. In the case of irrigation canals and drainage project, but I'm not going to discuss that, the question was different. The point was not uh, to know how ex exceptional were crests and how high flood crests were, but to know discharge. How much water would the river carry? And not just in an extreme state, but generally. As the issue of flood crest, the issue of discharge has also been a concern in the region for a long time and at the center of intellectual efforts that date as far back as the 17th century. As uh, irrigation uh, projects multiply in the 19th century, however, and they scale up as well, the issue of river discharge gained new salience. The resource uh, appears increasingly limited, water resource, and knowing discharge can decide on the feasibility and profitability of new infrastructure in rivers that are already saturated with existing uh, irrigation infrastructure. Uh, the method developed uh, and promoted uh, by 19th century European hydrologists, such as Elia Lombardini, whom uh, you see in the picture on the top, was based on the notion of mean discharge or average discharge. By plotting together uh, enough measurements of discharge, it would have been possible to calculate monthly, seasonal, and yearly averages of discharge. Based on that, in turn, it would have been possible to predict how rivers would behave in various periods of the year, and thus coupling successfully their flow to hydraulic infrastructure. I want to emphasize uh, what seemed to me two uh, major differences with historical records on flood crests. The scale taken into consideration in these efforts is no longer a river section, but increasingly so a whole river, even if measurements are done in selected points. Second, the temporal scale is shorter 
no need to accumulate centuries of extremes or to keep records of such extremes necessarily to know the average discharge a few decades of observation typically would suffice. And this is what Francesco Brioschi attempts to do towards the end of the century. Francesco Brioschi, by the way, is the founder of the Politecnico in Milan and a collaborator of Elia Lombardini. Now, an important point to keep in mind here is that such measures had very practical implications. And I would just briefly mention uh, the example of the Cavour Canal. Cavour Canal is a major irrigation infrastructure that still exists to this day uh, in Piedmont, uh, conceived in the 1840s and built by a British stock company between 1863 and 1866. The project was based on the assumption uh, that the Po River, from which the canal would take the water, had enough water to provide 110 cubic meter per second to the canal. Now, this assumption proved false. It proved wrong. As soon as the canal was completed, it appeared clearly that the river did not have enough water to provide a discharge of 110 cubic meter per second to the canal. The infrastructure was not working. This had major political and economic consequences. The company obviously had much less water to sell than anticipated. But more importantly, the Italian government refused to pay its financial contribution to the investors, a financial contribution that had been promised and that had been calculated into uh, expectations of profitability for the investment. This resulted quite quickly to the bankrupt of the company. The Italian state took up the management of the canal, but more importantly, it had to build a subsidiary intake from another river that you see in the map here, the Dora Baltea. So it was not just an issue of management, it was a matter of water. Even that, by the way, proved not enough. Even the second intake from another river proved not enough and the canal continued to have issues of discharge well into the 20th century. Let me see how I'm doing time-wise. Good. So. Let's move to the next uh, section uh, on energy. The, the question of predictability and of the scales at which it could be most successfully achieved became even more important at the turn of the 20th century with the advent and the rapid growth of hydroelectricity. The first large hydroelectric power plants in Italy uh, were built at, in the middle of the 1890s toward the middle and the end of the 1890s, last decade of the century. And they were the outcome of very large capital investment from national and foreign capitals. And they were accompanied by expectations, quite publicly stated, of geopolitical independence from imported British coal. The assessment of expected discharge from rivers that had to serve to power hydroelectric power plants uh, had immediate repercussion on capital investment and on the size of the plant. It was also important for the national government to assess the available energy resources of the country, as well as to arbitrate among competing users and basically govern this, the rush to hydropower that followed the successful completion of the first couple of power plants. This map shows the situation 10 years after the first hydroelectric power plant in the Po Valley was activated. This question became especially important after World War I, when hydroelectricity became a matter of national security and the development of all available water resources to produce energy became a state imperative. In this new context, the methods of estimation of mean discharge elaborated in the 19th century became even more important and so are their limitations. The main problem that hydrologists identified with the 19th century approach was that of the spatial scale of observation precisely localized in constant observations and measurements were not reliable enough. And at any rate, they were insufficient to assess all available water resources in a given territory, which was the purpose of this new uh, demand, both from investors and from the state. To meet the challenge, it was necessary to do two interrelated things. First, to expand the monitoring at the scale of a watershed, not just a river. Second, to combine measures of discharge 
with monitoring of precipitation, that is rainfall and snowfall. The inclusion of data on uh, snow and rainfall would allow for better estimation of discharge, as well as better understanding of the regime of the river and of its tributary. The scaling up was an institutional process. It involved the creation of new institutions of knowledge production and the networking of existing ones. An essential moment uh, in this process was the creation of the Poe Hydrographic Bureau. This service was first established in 1912 as an experimental service under the aegis of a Royal Commission on the Hydraulic Regime of the Po. that was the name. During World War I, it became a permanent institution, part of a national hydrographic service established during the war within the Ministry of Public Works. This service embodied the new approach. It combined a network of pluviometry observation distributed across the entire uh, river basin and stations of discharge measure measurements. And those are the, the, the uh, red and uh, black dots that you see in the map here. While some stations were automated uh, already in the 1910, the service relied also on an army of observers. That's a, a, an interesting story in itself, of course. There's another mic open. Uh, thank you. The result of this continued observations were published monthly in uh, bulletins, like the one you see here. And in the long term, such was the hope, this continuous monitoring will lead to a better understanding of the river's average discharges and their variation across seasons. Now, the scaling up, by the way, was not just horizontal, meaning across the surface of the watershed. It was also vertical. Starting in 1915, the Bureau established a special monitoring station in the Lys Glacier in the Piemontese Alps. And in 1925, in partnership with the Italian Glaciological Committee, the Bureau produced the first survey of Italian glaciers, which is still a reference to this day, by the way, and later, later the first systematic cartography, of which you see here a sheet, and in the red circle, the location of the Lys Glacier. Understanding glaciers uh, was also essential to understand and predict effectively the fluctuation of discharge of glacier-fed rivers, that is rivers that depend on melting glaciers in uh, the summer. And later, the first, uh, sorry, and uh, ultimately of the Po uh, River system itself. In parallel, the Bureau started an investigation into underground aquifers, into groundwater. And this involved as well systematic monitoring and studies on the relationship between precipitation, surface water, and aquifers. In the 1930s, the Bureau director published the first survey of underground water in some sections of, of the basin. This new knowledge, in turn, enabled new infrastructural choices, new scalar matches. Starting uh, in World War I, again, and even more so during the fascist regime, the watershed witnessed a series of increasingly strong infrastructural interventions aimed at coordinating water uses and increasing water availability for economic uses. This involved not only the construction of reservoirs, hydroelectric reservoirs, and the interconnection of power plants, although there was a lot of that, of course, but also the construction of infrastructure such as dams, mobile dams at the mouth of the major Italian lakes, like Lake Maggiore, Lake Como, Lake Garda, to regulate their outflow and distribute it to interconnected infrastructure. At the mouth of Lake Maggiore, for instance, uh, the water of the Ticino River was distributed across a number of pipes and canals and specific amounts calculated on average discharges during the winter and the summer. And this is what you see here in this image, the two schemes of allocation for winter and for summer discharge. This new hydraulic infrastructure was conceived with the aim of scaling up the coordination and regulation of water resources for agriculture and for energy generation. And as I have written elsewhere, it entails scaling up envirotechnical system building, or to put it otherwise, infrastructural interconnection. The scaling up was predicated upon the new understanding of the scale of water circulation, mean precipitation, mean discharges and their interconnection. 
the scaling up of the 20th century was in many respects a major success, at least on the midterm. It allowed for better predictability. It allowed for infrastructural consolidation and it prevented major failures like the Cavour Canal to repeat again. It allowed for a better match of skills, skills of water circulation and skills of hydraulic infrastructure. Infrastructural interconnection, such as that exemplified in the scheme, again for the Ticino River, in turn underpinned the massive economic growth of the region over the 20th century, both its agricultural sector and its industrial sector. Some scales, however, remained out of the picture. While hydrologists devoted much time and attention to scaling up their understanding of water availability, that is how much water there was, how much water should be expected at a given time for hydraulic infrastructure, they virtually ignored issues of water quality. Now, water quality was obviously an issue already in the 19th century. And there were, of course, localized pollution conflicts way back into the early modern period. Nevertheless, regulations focused uh, mostly on sources of drinking water, while public health officers performed measurements of water quality, typically at an urban scale, not at the scale of entire river basins. Starting in the 1960s, and increasingly so in the 1970s, however, signs of an unexpected or at least unaccounted for circulation of toxicants and pollution at the river basin scale multiplied, such as the proliferation of algae in lakes and along the Adriatic coast at the mouth of the river near the delta. A new wave of research in the 70s performed mostly by hydrobiologists, not hydrologists, at new institutions of water monitoring started to document the scale of the circulation and its consequences on the entire river system and its life. This had direct impact on water infrastructure. Downstream users, such as the Canale Emiliano Romagnolo, the last major diversion from the Po that you're seeing in the map here and circle the, the point where it takes the water from the Po, uh, users of this canal feared that their infrastructure was unusable due to poor water quality. They just could not use that water, it was too polluted. And it is not by chance that the managers of the canal were the most active promoters of new studies on pollution at the river basin scale. Partnering with scientists and clamoring for stricter regulation of pollution across the entire basin. The most dangerous uh, mismatch, however, sorry, going too fast, yeah. The most dangerous mismatch, however, is perhaps that which links the hydrology of the watershed to global climate change. While hydrologists expanded the spatial scale of observation to the watershed, they never called into question a fundamental premise, the stability of the system they were observing. The assumption of a stable state of water systems was at the roots of the very approach of quantification of discharge via seasonal, monthly, and annual averages. Within this approach, extreme variations such as flood and droughts were considered as exceptional events with a certain recurrence in time, but within a fundamentally stable hydrological regime. As a result, calculation of discharge were based mostly on recent observations and did not take into account past historical record. They operated ultimately on a relatively short time scale, even shorter than flood crest records that I mentioned at the start of the presentation. At the turn of the 1980s, such an approach was still central to official institutional synthesis like this one here, that you see in the in this uh, slide, written by the director, the then director of the Po River Hydrographic Bureau, and published in 1981. It is only at the end of the new century that researchers and regulators started worrying about a declining discharge, and reflect to its links to planetary climate change. This entailed, for this group of hydrologists and managers, the acknowledgement of two scalar mismatches: a spatial one which originates from the poorly understood link between watershed precipitation patterns and hydrological patterns and global climate. Links that were of course acknowledged, but they were poorly understood well into the late 19th century. 
And a temporal one, which originates from the exclusion of the longer term time scale from calculations of average discharges and hydrological regimes. This mismatches have major political and economic consequences for the present and the future of the region. The infrastructure of the basin has been dimensioned based on knowledge produced at the wrong scale. It cannot therefore fulfill its promise into the new century, into our century. The water component of hydraulic infrastructure simply cannot comply as it is expected to do. This means that the entire infrastructural interconnection needs to be rethought and adjusted to the new reality and that water as infrastructure has to be appraised anew in a context of high uncertainty. I do not know, of course, and I'm concluding, uh, I do not know what uh, will happen and, and it's not the task of the historian to, uh, to tell it anyway, I think. As a conclusion, I would only underscore three uh, main points that I think we can perhaps draw from, from this uh, that I told you. The first point concerned the usefulness of scale to think about environment and infrastructure. As I mentioned in the introduction, scale is sometimes implicit in uh, envirotechnical scholarship, but rarely tackled explicitly and upfront. However, I think it's a very useful analytical tool precisely for the multi-scalar nature of environmental processes, both in time and space. The case of water I've briefly discussed here offers, I believe, or I hope at least, a good example. Scale helps to analyze the way environmental systems and infrastructure are, are coupled, made to match, which is a fundamental challenge of environment and infrastructure industry in general. Second, in the case of the poor watershed and of water as infrastructure, ma matching scales is essential to the project of predictability that is at the core of modern hydraulic infrastructure. To make hydraulic infrastructure work, foreseeable water is indispensable. Stated in other words, predictability is what makes water as infrastructure possible. Predictability was to a significant extent and still is a matter of scale. Occasional observations at the scale of individual water courses were not reliable enough. Scaling up to entire watersheds and including rain, snow, glaciers, and underground aquifers increased the predictive ability of water knowledge and in turn the performance of water as infrastructure, be it in agriculture or in energy production. Yet, and this is my third and final point, through scale, we can also learn something about the historical limits to this project, perhaps. The technology of predictability developed to turn water into infrastructure excluded pollution, for instance, with direct consequences on infrastructure itself, as I mentioned in the case of the Canal Emiliano. But perhaps more importantly, predictability was, was based on the assumption of a stable nature and excluded from sight the temporal scale of climatic and hydrological variations. The question then is whether the water infrastructure we have inherited from the last centuries can deal with the structural mismatch generated by the climate breakdown and at which economic and political costs. And more broadly, perhaps the question for historians of environment and infrastructure like us is not only the scales of natural processes, not only how the scale of natural processes and infrastructure are made to match, but also to grapple with the reality that they just cannot ever really match and confront the historical implications of, of this reality. Thank you for, for your attention. Grazie mille Giacomo, thank you very much for your presentation. Now our second speaker is Frédéric Rabel. Frédéric Rabel is an historian of science, technology and environment. He is a research fellow at the French Center for Scientific Research, currently based at the Center MacBlock in Berlin. He is the author of four books, among which I just recall uh, Peria à Besoin d'eau. Uh, his latest book on administrative posters in 19th century France will come out next year and is currently working on a new book on the history of participatory, uh, 
participatory procedures in the context of infrastructural projects. And the title of his presentation is The Long Lasting Relationship Between Environment, Infrastructure and Participation. And Professor Graber, the floor is yours. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. OK, perfect. Um, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I won't share a PowerPoint presentation. I hope that will be OK with you and try to get your attention uh, anyway. So I, I don't know exactly what infrastructures are, but um, I guess we could agree that there is a large definition and a narrow one. In the larger sense, infrastructure may be material or social prerequisites for human actions, and that includes pretty much everything. But clearly, the organizers of this conference meant infrastructure in a more restricted sense as technological systems. Dirk van Laak, one of the major historians working on infrastructures, defined them as networks offering the material basis for circulations of all kinds, transport, communication, um, supply, sanitation, typically. As an actor's category, infrastructure is obviously recent. It really becomes relevant in the second half of the 20th century. But that doesn't mean, of course, that it cannot be useful as an analyst's category for earlier period. Now, the interesting point is that when tries to apply the concept of infrastructures to earlier periods, one gets involved in larger questions like um, state building, mass society and liberalism. Dirk van Laak, for instance, explains that certainly one could find some forerunners like the Romans with their aqueducts and roads, but that they lacked something typically modern, which is central for infrastructure in his view, namely a systematic ambition to network space and society together. That, in Van Laak's view, is characteristic of modern society starting somewhere in the 18th century and crucially linked to state building, territorial ambitions and development, but also to mass society and liberalism. If circulations are central to infrastructures, then one can ask circulations for whom? Van Laak asks, asks precisely that question, and his answer is quite convincing. Circulation is never for everybody, since infrastructure always bear restrictions and inequalities, or typically fees to be paid, which all cannot afford. But circulation is nevertheless for all in principle, for indefinite users. I'm not sure if they are always users. Sometimes they may be low, more like consumers or citizens, but Van Laak surely has a point here. Infrastructures have a collective dimension. They are directed towards the public for the use and benefit of all, even if in fact, these are usually unequally distributed. This collective dimension appears clearly in the notions used to describe infrastructures in the 18th and 19th century, like public works or public utilities, etc. This is the kind of question I would like to address. Symbolically and rhetorically, at least, the public is important for infrastructures. Historians have considered this question of infrastructures public but they have situated the public either as decision makers or as users. Both are important dimension, but I would like to show in this talk that there is another approach to this question. Each infrastructure project has to deal with the public, which is an, ab an abstraction, an indefinite number of unknown people, and at the same time may become a very concrete number of people feeling concerned about that project not only users and decision makers, but also owners, taxpayers, competitors, ordinary citizens, for various reasons. There is a great uncertainty about that public. People can pop up at various stages of the project with various concerns about it and disturb the project significantly. What I'm trying to do is to study the domestication of that public in the context of infrastructure projects. In the French case, this domestication has a long history. Participatory procedures have been developed, especially since the 18th century, specifically to instantiate the public, to situate them 
to control and instrumentalize him. So I will first present briefly a research project I have been working on in the last years about public participation in the context of project making in France from the 18th century. And then I will try to figure out what is specific about a more recent period starting in the late 60s and 1970s with the rise of the environment as an object of concern or rather as a new object at all. My research is centered on administrative inquiries, which came to be known in the early 19th century as enquête publique, which is the French translation for the English public inquiry, though there are really important differences between the two. Uh, these administrative procedures had various names or no name at all, but they all function in the same way. They appealed to an indefinite public to react to a project opening a register in the city hall or in the prefecture in which everybody could express his opinion of whatever nature they might be. After a given time, a commissioner was appointed to assess the importance of the various opinions, which in most cases he declared to be irrelevant. Then the inquiry was closed, the project was authorized and no form of opposition against it was admissible anymore. So from the start, enquête publique were a very disappointing form of public participation, if you want. But they nevertheless survived up to our days because they were and still are an essential tool for authorizing infrastructural development. Enquête publique became so important because they provided the legal justification of project making. Each enquête proved the utilité publique of a project, literally its public usefulness. This notion, utilité publique, has a general meaning of common good, common welfare, but also a more restricted, restrictive legal meaning of superior right, which authorizes to break inferior rights. The notion goes back to the Ancien Régime, where it was widely used. In Ancien Régime France, when a person or a group had a project of whatever nature, um, they had to seek authorization first, which usually came in the form of a private law, which gave them specific rights, privileges. Since these rights could interfere with general law or other private rights, private law were subjected to a series of inquiries organized by the prosecutor in the higher courts. The first inquiry was a judicial one. It was called a decomodo et incomodo procedure. It aimed at establishing if the project was useful for the public, a necessary condition before projectors could be given new rights, which usually meant restricting the rights of others. The logic behind this utilité publique was a clearly monarchical one. The monarchy could break some rights and give rights to others because it claimed to have a perfect knowledge of the project and its possible consequences, because it could stand above all interests and actors. And from this higher abstract position, it could balance between advantages and disadvantages and decide that all things considered, the usefulness of the project for the public outweighed the sacrifice it would demand from others. This utility publique was produced in a legal framework using the classical judicial inquiries. A few witnesses were asked to come to court and say what they knew about the project in order to establish a judicial truth about it. The striking fact about the Twizy's witnesses is that though they were heard separately and spoke directly without being asked questions by the judge, they usually adopted a unanimous position about the project. In the legal order of the Ancien Regime, the number of the witnesses didn't really matter, but their unanimity was central for generating judicial truth. And obviously, it was produced by a meticulous choice of witnesses. If the number of participants didn't matter in these decomodo inquiries, Prosecutors in the higher courts were nevertheless eager to know more about the reactions of potentially concerned citizens, especially since projectors could have embellished their scheme and not anticipated the full range of consequences others would have to bear. 
Therefore, they uh, completed their examinations with two other inquiries. One was concerned with expertise and asked questions specialists could evaluate the impact of the project. And the other inquiry was directly concerned with the reactions of potentially impacted citizens. These inquiries were significantly called consentement, consent, even though consulted citizens often rejected the project. The prosecutor didn't ask everybody, but selected some groups and individuals he thought is particularly impacted by the project. Contrary to the Decomodo inquiries, the purpose was not to produce judicial truth, but to make sure no important matter had been overlooked and, that the same, and at the same time to probe potential opponents on their intentions and judicial means. The Ancien Regime therefore distinguished between a judicial formality proving the utilité publique of the project, relying on a limited number of selecting and selected and obliging witnesses, and the larger consulting procedure, not open to all, but allowing many potential opponents to voice their disagreement. These procedures ceased to exist with the French Revolution for several reasons, mainly two. First, privileges and private law disappeared, or rather they became really exceptions. And second, judicial courts couldn't hear future matters anymore. They couldn't authorize or prohibit projects which became the prerogative of a new branch of law, namely administrative law, much of which was created by the administration itself in the 19th century. The necessity of controlling and authorizing projects remained, especially for contested economic ventures, post-revolutionary regimes were actively encouraging. Authorization, after all, is both regulation and promotion. So, after the revolution, new administrative procedures were introduced in order to authorize such projects, and again, they included some participatory devices. They were introduced on a piecemeal basis. To take a few examples, in 1791 for mining schemes, in 1796 for mills, dams, factories, or whatever changes one could make on river flows, in 1801 for municipal projects of various kinds, in 1807 for land reclamation projects, in 1810 for potentially polluting industrial plans, in 1829 for public works projects, in 1833 for all projects involving expropriations. At the beginning, some of these procedures operated in a way close to Ancien Regime inquiries. They didn't call everybody, but they selected a few witnesses, usually neighbors or owners, who could participate, sometimes inviting them for a local visit on the site where the project was supposed to take place. But after the 1820s, all these procedures began to converge towards a common model, which started to be called enquête publique. This convergence was a response to numerous problems these early inquiries had, especially concerning the way the witnesses were selected. One could always suspect the administration of choosing compliant persons to produce apparent consent and silencing opponents. In the more liberal context following 1815, selecting witnesses to produce explicit consent got more and more illegitimate. The solution to that problem came in the form of administrative posters. The poster gradually became a central tool in these inquiries. It allowed to call all persons concerned by a project without defining in advance who that should be. Posters addressed potentially everybody, so that all who had something to, th to say about the project had an opportunity to say it. The use of posters in the announcement of the inquiries therefore enabled the administration to claim that all those who remained silent, all those who did not participate, were effectively consenting. And in most cases, that was nearly everybody comparing to the very few people who dared or bothered participating. 19th century enquête publique first differed significantly from Ancien Regime inquiries. 
Enquête publique no longer distinguish between the larger consulting procedure and a narrow legal procedure proving the utilité publique of the project. Enquête publique still aimed at proving the utilité publique with exactly the same logic, an abstract point of view standing above all interests and rights and justifying a redistribution of rights and interests in the name of public interest. But 19th century enquête publique henceforth produces utilité publique in a new way by asking for the consent of all and claiming that their silence meant implicit consent. This widening of participation also changed the meaning of participation. Participation was not only a legal question anymore. It was not only about involving the people potentially impacted by the project in order to assess their rights and possible damages. By calling everybody, the administration increasingly insisted that impacted citizens were not necessarily the best participants, since they were usually blinded by their private interests. At the same time, the administration declared that enlarging participation could generate productive feedbacks. People with no direct interest could contribute to improve the project and they could offer a form of control, even of counter power to the administration if the latter failed to see the project's defects. In addition to its legal meaning, participation thus increasingly gained a liberal technocratic meaning where experts are the ideal participants and confronting arguments were supposed to improve projects, even if in fact such experts seldom popped up in the enquête publique by themselves. With the enquête publique, the French administration invented a radically new form of participation. It opened participation widely for everybody, even for strangers, for women, for independently of social and economic status. The administration could really claim to have called everybody, and this was actually central to its claim to make the public speak, to express the will of an abstract totality. Everybody. Even if this totality was paradoxical, since the public, in most cases, remained completely silent. But this radical opening of participation could bear a political meaning. This totality, everybody the public. That could be the people. The administration was very cautious in the early decades of the 19th century to counter this interpretation. Enquête publique were purely administrative and had no political meaning whatsoever. This was coherent with dominant political theories of the early 19th century. The doctrinaire movement, for instance, con considered that though only very few people should have political rights, no form of government could maintain itself on the long run if it do did not find some connections with the masses in order to gain a sense of what is desirable or acceptable in society. Enquête publique were typically one of these administrative devices that allowed decision makers to keep the connection with citizens. Enquête publique didn't change significantly from the 1830s onwards. In the 19th and 20th century, it was one of the major tools for justifying and authorizing industrial and infrastructural projects in France. Enquête publique proliferated at an increasingly rapid pace as development went forward. Its meaning was unchanged, both legal and technocratic. On the one hand, the inquiry secured the rights of projectors against riparian claims, establishing the utilité publique of the project as a superior right. In the case of infrastructure projects, the utilité publique was almost tautological for the whole period. On the other hand, the inquiry supposedly proved the quality of the project, since all possible arguments against it had been heard and dealt with. During the 19th and, and most of the 20th century, this participatory procedure never really had a political meaning. OK, public had always been disappointing, but from the 1960s on, they increasingly got under critique, especially from emerging movements concerned with the protection of nature and cultural heritage. These movements asked for a larger role for civil society in decision making, um, concerning large projects. And they rejected enquête publique as a pure formality where arguments and opinions were only collected to clear them out. 
They called for a reform. The project should be discussed openly at an early stage in order to take into account environmental concerns and to be able to change projects accordingly and reduce their impacts. Such claims progressively entered the political arena in the 1970s and even gained supporters in the French state administration. This rapid development was not only a response to changing expectations inside French society, but also to international pressure. In 1970, the United States adopted the NEPA, the National Environment Policy Act, which introduced the principle of environmental impact assessments as a primary obligation before large projects potentially affecting the environment could be authorized. The NEPA procedure included forms of public participation, especially concerning the issues that should be considered in the assessment. Similar procedures rapidly spread all over the world thanks to active promotion by international organizations. The OECD especially was one of the major protagonists of this international movement in the 1970s and 80s, promoting impact assessment as a model linking participation in environment. The question was discussed at the European level after 1973. Environment regulation, environmental regulations were seen in Europe as both inevitable and potentially distorting economic competition, since assessments and participation could be more expensive and time consuming in some countries than in others. Member states should thus seek to harmonize the environmental legislation in respect to preliminary procedures. Several studies were launched by the European Commission in order to reflect how impact assessments could be introduced on a European level without disrupting existing national participatory procedures. The fear of rising costs, though, hindered the adoption of European-wide measures on that subject up to 1985. Several countries therefore decided to introduce environmental impact assessments on their own. France, for instance, introduced a very light version of impact assessments in its 1976 nature protection law. For politicians and administrators alike, Enquête Publique raised a new question in the 1970s. Could this very old procedures, nearly unchanged since the 19th century, cherished by planners and investors, could the enquête publique still count as participation in the face of growing claims by environmental movements and emerging international standards? The response was clearly no in principle, leading to various attempts to reform the procedure from the late 70s to the 90s. But despite these reforms, the procedure didn't change much. If you look at how these inquiries evolved in practice, the answer to the question is clearly yes, enquête publique were enough participation. The major attempt at reforming the enquête publique occurred in 1983 with the so-called Bouchardeau Law, which, which official title is Loi sur la démocratisation des enquêtes publiques, announcing a democratization of these inquiries. If one examines the text of the law, the implementing decrees later adopted by the government and the practice of these inquiries in the 80s, one doesn't see major changes. The only novelty consisted in the possibility of organizing a meeting with the public, but such a meeting had to be authorized by the prefect and, and in fact seldom took place. And anyway, the meeting had no binding consequences and didn't affect the inquiry significantly. So you may wonder what the democratization title was about. It appears more clearly if one reads the parliamentary debates of uh, 1983. The proponents of the law obviously had great ambitions in that respect. Huguette Bouchardeau, the secretary from the environment, declared, for instance, that the environment is a privileged ground for democracy and democracy itself a condition for the preservation of the environment, a typical 1980s assertion. So people should be allowed to participate in the decision-making process if one didn't want them to end up in resignation or revolt. But participation shouldn't impede infrastructural projects, which were still considered central to economic development of the country. 
And participation didn't mean letting the public decide either. The public could offer a constructive contribution, controlling the process and suggesting improvements, but democracy still meant that democratically elected authorities had to design alone so that they could help be held responsible for their choices. In 1983, participation was not yet linked to the idea of a crisis of representative democracy, as would later be the case in the 90s, but it had obviously become necessary to give the enquête publique a new meaning, a political meaning, in terms of democracy. What was new after 1983 was not the inquiry itself, but that it could now be presented as democratic. This didn't affect the other meanings. Enquête publique were still held, first of all, for legal reasons, and secondly, in a liberal technocratic spirit in order to improve the project by incorporating constructive critique, as had been the case since the early 19th century. But now it could also be presented as democratic, as a democratic tool. That brings me to my conclusion, which is uh, very provisional, as you will see. There are two parts in my story. One is about industrial and infrastructural, infrastructural projects and how participation has been used to justify such developments from the early 19th century on. The other part of the story is about the global rise of participatory procedures from the 1970s on, which were directly linked to the rise of the environment as an object of political and societal concern. Environment and participation became so closely interwined after the 70s that anyone dealing with one couldn't afford not to mention the other. In the 1990s, every important actor on the global scale had become green and participatory, and usually at exactly the same time. Now, the link between the two terms was often, if not always, involving infrastructures, or rather infrastructural projects. A significant part of environmental regulation after the 1970s was not directly concerned with the environment itself, but with how to regulate economic projects in order to make them less harmful for the environment, without hindering the projects themselves, since economic development remained a central value. Now, I may address the question of the organizers of this conference more directly. Is there a relationship between environment and infrastructure? Yes, there have been, uh, at least for the last 50 years or so, during which these terms had a relatively unified and clear meaning. And this relation between the two is actually a relation between three terms, infrastructures acting as an operator. There is environment and participation because they are infrastructures. Infrastructures are the occasion and the place where participation and environment meet, and up to a certain point where they come to existence. What I hope to have established is that these three terms, though they are not actors category before the more recent period, have been interwined for as long as we may call, uh, of what we may call the Industrial Revolution. Forms of participation have been used on the long run to justify industrial and infrastructural projects impacting the environment. Most of the 19th century administrative procedures I presented today had a connection with what we would call the environment. Many of the relevant projects concern the development of natural resources, mining, land reclamation, river construction, etc. Though so these objects were treated separately in specific legislations, in terms of participation, they were conceived in similar terms as concerned with a common problem. Projects affecting the rights and interests of riparians. Projects which may have unintended consequences, which had to be checked and improved. The continuity with recent decades is striking in that respect. We are still facing a very similar problem. The advent of the environment as a concept in the 60s and 70s is thus not only a consequence of a change in perception that development, increasing resources and circulations come with sacrifices and degradation, which is not new, but become more and more unacceptable. 
Environment may also be the new term we have found to name this old and familiar problem we have with industrial and infrastructural projects, which is how to authorize them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederic, and thank you also for answering yes to your last question. Otherwise, it would have been a problem for us. And so now let me introduce you the third speaker, uh, who is Simone Muller. Simone Muller is principal investigator of the research group Azardus Travel, Ghost Takers and the Global Waste Economy at the Research Council Center in Munich. She works at the intersection of globalization studies, economic and social history, and environmental humanities. She is currently the academic speaker of a new graduate program, uh, Rethinking the Environment, the Environmental Humanities and Ecological Transformation of Society, co-organized by the University of Habsburg and the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. And the title of her presentation, which is slightly different from the one in the program, is 30 New Landscapes, Infrastructures and the Global Waste Economy. Professor Müller, the floor is yours. You have to turn uh, to switch on your microphone. Okay, it should be on now, is it? And we can see also the presentation. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So first of all, thank you so much for, for having me for the invitation. And I'm particularly excited to be in that panel because uh, I feel like the story that I have to tell on Dirty New Natures does relate to both um, the stories that we just heard from, from Giacomo Parinello and Frederic Canaba. So, um, Dirty New Natures, Infrastructures and the Global Waste Economy. Here we go. Here we go. The ash would no doubt bring progress to the village of Puerto Castilla. So, Edgardo Pascal, proprietor of as Alma Senadora Amudami, a one-size-fits-all construction and import company. It would revive the small Honduran port city on the Caribbean Sea, where allegedly Christopher Columbus had set foot on the Central American mainland, and that had once been a key port for the U.S. American United Food Company. In a letter to the Honduran National Port Authority, Pascal detailed the many benefits the import of up to 200,000 tons of incinerator ash from Philadelphia would bring to an area that had been disconnected from larger national and international networks of trade and travel throughout the second half of the 20th century. Using the ash as landfill for the wetland area around the port, they could reclaim watery territory for road construction to reach cut-off communities further inland. Additionally, this land-filling project would bring jobs, revenues, and exterminate malaria. Skull sincerely believed that Honduras would greatly benefit with this project because the material afforded them a good opportunity for stabilizing areas which at present present hostile environments. To use potentially hazardous waste to transform hostile environments into what then implicitly would be civilized and manufactured landscapes of progress was a conundrum that stopped me in my tracks as a researcher of the global waste economy. How could the building of roads and the disposal of waste be so intricately linked? Pascal's letter got me thinking how yeah, infrastructure... Pardon? Can I, can I continue? Yes, please. Sorry, there was something. Sorry. OK. So Pascal's letter got me thinking how infrastructures and notions of nature and progress became oddly intertwined with the globalization of hazardous waste in the 1980s to create what I call dirty new natures all across the global south. Those dirty new natures, I argue, are emblematic of a gap widening since the advent of modern environmentalism between greening industrial countries in the global north 
and economically struggling countries of the Global South. More importantly for the context of this conference, those dirty new natures are illustrations of the conviction that infrastructures come at the cost of environmental exploitation and degradation, and that they need to overcome hostile environment. In the context of this session on scales, however, they are also an example of the globalization of particular envirotechnical systems coupled with a long durée, um, with long durée practices of environmental racism. In my deliberations, dirty new natures, infrastructures in the global waste economy, I'm taking inspiration from the work of cultural anthropologist Ashley Kars and Kaka Farrington in the context of the added volume on infrastructure, environment, and life in the Anthropocene. Both emphasize how boundaries and gaps as those between environment and infrastructure are conceptual spaces and cultural landscapes that are highly loaded with meaning and value. The title of this talk, Dirty New Natures in Turn, signifies my indebtedness to the works of Dolly and Finn Arna Jorgensen and Sarah Pritchett, who mirroring environment history and SDS in their edited volume, New Natures. And I was particularly excited to see that um, Giacomo Parinelli and I had um, the same point of departure uh, when it comes to our reading list. But what you might notice is that kind of what I'm talking about is also um, an offspring of a project that I have been thinking about a lot in the past couple of years on toxic timescapes, examining toxicity across time and space, an edited volume that I'm doing together with maybe with Oma Nielsen from Norway, which finally, finally will be out with Ohio University Press next year. It doesn't, it doesn't have a nice cover yet. But what we do in there is to um, propose toxic timescapes as a conceptual tool that allows us to think through the multiplicities of times and scales, times and places, scapes uh, that come together uh, when we like, examine toxicity. But let me return to my story of Honduras. A Gaga Pascal's letter of March 1987 to the Honduran National Port Authority canvassing for their support to the import of at least 200,000 tons of US waste to be used as fill on their property fell into the heydays of the unequal ex and import of hazardous waste material globally. Commencing with modern environmentalism in the richer parts of the world in the 1970s and intensifying over the decade of the 1980s, increasing disposal costs for equally increasing material declared as hazardous waste in the industrial countries had made it attractive for waste traders to look south. In the United States particularly, the implementation of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act in 1984 and given export notifications with the Environmental Protection Agency a massive push. Often, the material would go to countries such as Honduras, where different or not existing environmental regulations turned the same material into a harmless commodity. Pascal's potential trading partners were the Bahamas-based Amalgamated Shipping Corporation, which served as the extension of the US American company Coastal Cares Corporation, which in turn was a subcontractor for the disposal of 200,000 tons of municipal incinerator ash from Philadelphia. Originally, Coastal Cares and Amalgamated Shipping Corporation had, a, had secured a contract with Panama for the disposal of the material. But after massive local protests in the context of rising anti-Americanism in Panama, the deal had fallen through. Now, coastal carriers were looking for alternative places, and I'm quoting here, in other countries where there were disposal sites near a dock which must be filled in order to improve humid health conditions. And the example of um, Puerto Castilla is only one of the many, many um, locations that they approached. Um, but like for, for the purpose of this talk, I chose to only pick, pick out one of the communities. 
Um, Puerto Castilla, with its port surrounded by mangroves and wetlands, neatly fit the category of what coastal carriers was looking for. By the 1980s, the deal to trade waste disposal for landfill was common in the setup of the global waste economy. Waste traders, such as coastal carriers, had learned that their exports sold best if packaged together with infrastructures promising economic and social development for underdeveloped areas. Also, their sales packages drew on an old and pervasive practice to reuse dirt or waste to add new land to make room for more people, more businesses, and the needs of a port. All around the globe, many a coastal or riverine city had expended through building on land reclaimed through waste fills. Um, as Martin Molosi points out in his epical work, Fresh Kills, a history of consuming and discarding in New York City, about one third of what is today Manhattan. Um, so as you see like on this map, if you follow the cursor roughly from here down to here, so which is from roughly around Wall Street to the southern tip of the island is reclaimed marshlands filled with 17th, 18th and 19th century rubble, dirt and waste. Through the title of my talk, Dirty New Nature, I wanted to highlight how dirt has long been used to produce new natures, meanwhile converting marshlands into dump sites. And also how with the globalization of hazardous waste, waste traders also globalized this particular practice. Yet, while the practice of using waste as fill to reclaim watery areas was an old one, the composition of the fill material had changed fundamentally over the centuries from rubble and dirt to potentially hazardous waste. Up until the first half of the 20th century, the composition of waste was primarily one of dirt, rubble, paper, and food waste. Shepherded by the chemical industrial revolution and the age of mass consumption with its throwaway culture, this composition of waste had changed fundamentally. Synthetic chemicals, primarily in the form of plastics, played a particularly big role in this change. By the 1980s, plastic packaging had replaced unpackaged items in grocery stores in the industrial countries, and single packaged items, um, such as, for instance, TV dinners that were then just kind of very prominent, had become part of a middle class lifestyle. As a result, incinerator ashes representing the burned remnants of household wastes did end up containing a full host of toxic chemicals heavy metals and PCBs, which, if used as fill material in swamp areas or wetlands, could severely harm flora and fauna, contaminate soil and groundwater, and so enter the food chain. For Puerto Castilla, dirty new natures, so not only meant new natures created through the use of dirt, but also new natures possibly contaminated through the kind of dirt used for the fill. Despite a potential environmental and health hazard looming on the horizon, Pascal and his supporters, as well as the many others that were approached in the Global South with schemes similar or the exact same scheme as this one, they found Kosakira's waste input proposal an attractive deal. Uh, here I'm quoting from Pascal's letter, and it he says the incinerator ash would stabilize areas belonging to the National Port Authority located in the peninsula, eliminating swamps and watery areas which constitute breeding grounds for mosquitoes, and with this action improving the health of the port farmers. The facilities of the port would be utilized, thus bringing revenues not previously anticipated for the National Port Authority and also creating new jobs in the process. Finally, in the context of the landfilling project, an access road to Caserio Baraco Blanco would be improved. Coastal carriers would build this road and also create any other infrastructure necessary for the management of the landfill. 
Anthropologist Ashley Kars has pointed out that people treat infrastructures as indices of a variety of other social and economic and political phenomena. So in this line, I suggest that for Pascal and others supportive of such waste import schemes in the global south, the use of incinerator ash as landfill material to turn swamp areas or wetland areas into commercial ground was an expression of their notion of progress and the role of infrastructure and environmental protection in it. It was part of their desire to reconnect those remote places with global networks of trade and commerce, but it was also indebted to the ill-fated logics of colonial legacies of ecological exploitation. In 19 87, Puerta Castilla had the air of a community that, similarly to the Grimm brothers' story of Sleeping Beauty, had fallen asleep decades ago and had just not yet been kissed awake again. Similarly to other communities approached by waste traders throughout the decade, Puerta Castilla was a remote port village of only a couple of hundred people that provided some sort of basic shipping infrastructure but that was otherwise disconnected from the world at large and remote, even in Honduran terms. Puerto Castilla is approximately 20 kilometers north of Trujillo, the capital of the Colón Department of Honduras. It sits on the inland side of a peninsula that forms the Bay of Trujillo and shelters a small shrimp fishing community for the big Atlantic waves and winds. The peninsula also encloses a deep water port, which singles out this settlement from under other Honduran coastal villages. Strategically located on the northern Atlantic shore of Honduras, almost vis-a-vis -vis, um, Havana in Cuba, Puerto Castilla appeared as a place that could swiftly and inexpensively be reconnected with larger global networks of commerce, travel and trade and so yet again serve as an important entrance port for foreign goods and investments coming to Honduras more generally. To imagine Puerto Castilla as a major Honduran port city connected with international networks of trade and commerce was not far-fetched if one considered the history of the place. First famous as a place where allegedly Christopher Columbus had set foot on Central American mainland, but the Castilla had become the location of Spanish fortifications during the colonial period. Later, the settlement enjoyed a short economic career as an outpost of the trade empire of United Fruit Company in the early part of the 20th century. United Fruit, a US-based producer and marketer of tropical fruit for export to the United States, opened its facilities in Puerto Castilla in 1919. United Fruit had been founded in Boston in 1899, and by the early 1930s, it had swallowed up all other companies in the market, so that it was the largest employer in Central America. United Fruit owned or leased properties in Honduras, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama, Colombia, Cuba, Jamaica, and other countries of Central and South America in the West Indies. In many of these countries, United Fruit was more than an employer, often taking on classical tasks of states, such as building infrastructure. And this is kind of like what you see in the, on, the, on the two images um, that you have here, kind of like the railroad tracks on the bottom and then and the trains, the loading of the trains and the railroad cars. So United Fruit as a company cleared and planted undeveloped tracts of land, it created an extensive railroad and port facility system and operated a large steamship unit known as the Great White Fleet. When United Fruit expanded in Honduras in the early 20th century, taking the land surrounding the ports of Tela and Puerto Castilla, it brought one of its engineers over from Guatemala to build a railroad, make improvements to the ports and clear the plantation land. As a subsidiary, United Fruit Company had set up the, the had set up the Turkseo Railroad Company to exploit the contracts and concessions that it had newly received from the Honduran government. The American company began the construction of the railroad in 1913 
reaching Puerto Castilla, the final destination on a 96 kilometer line starting in Olanchito in August, 1921. To the wealthy citizens of Olanchito, the capital of the Honduran Department of Yara, the railroad connection to Puerto Castilla and its port symbolized the easy and expeditious road to the United States of America. It turned Puerto Castilla once again into a nodal point of global connections as it had once been when under Spanish rule. Little had remained of these prospects of Puerto Castilla after United Fruit left the area in the late 1930s. The company had closed the facility as a result of the Panama, Panama disease applied on the roots of the banana tree. With the closing of its port facilities in Puerto Castilla, United Fruit also abandoned the railroad it had built two decades earlier, leaving, Hondur leaving Hondurans to deal with an increasingly deteriorating infrastructure, which they eventually dismantled. In the 1940s, the Honduran government moved the village east on the peninsula to allow the American forces to establish a small naval base by the port of Puerto Castilla to support the Allies in their fight against Nazi Germany. At the time, Allied forces believed that Nazi Germany planned an attack on the Panama Canal and so included Puerto Castilla in a defense ring system around the Caribbean and Central America. For the community, however, the forced move only signified a substantial deterioration of their lives. The Honduran National Port Authority, which took over the port from the villages, had promised that it would build 250 decent houses and give villagers work. Yet four decades later, none of this had happened, and people were still waiting on the modern sewage system. Yet, when Edgardo Pascal visited the site in February 1987, he detailed the contours of a poor and underdeveloped region suffering from massive unemployment, poverty, ill health, and a lack of infrastructure more generally. When the American company Coastal Carriers approached Pascal and the Honduran National Port Authority with a scheme that included the infrastructural development of Puerto Castilla, it appeared as a long sought after opportunity. It was an opportunity, however, that built on the perpetuation of a relationship between Honduras and different Western countries that have been formed since colonialism. It was a relationship in which foreign powers, ranging from the Spanish to the US Americans, rather than the Honduran government, took on the role to develop, and I'm putting that in quotation marks, land through the building of infrastructure, such as fortifications, roads, ports, or railroads. And I just want to, as a side note, add, I mean, this is also kind of like with United Fruit, that the time when the notion of, of or the, the idea of the banana republic as a, as a failed state um, comes up, which serves to the Americans also as a justification to like move into those areas and um, take on state-like um, activities. At the same time, it was also a relationship in which it was clear that the price for these infrastructures was the exploitation of Honduran nature. During the colonial period, the Spanish had taken out vast riches of the country. And traditionally, the Caribbean coastal lowlands where Puerto Castilla is located, have been Honduras' most exploited region because of its riches in tropical fruit, forest, and seafood. Under the reign of United Fruit Company in the region, Puerto Castilla had been the largest port for tropical fruit exports from Honduras to the United States. Now with coastal carriers, the Americans returned to use Honduras' environment for the disposal of their hazardous waste. At this point, I think it's important to zoom in more closely to Puerto Castilla to understand the attractiveness of the waste import deal more fully beyond the fact that it represents how it's always been done. Anthropologist Craig Farrington, writing about communities on Paraguay's rural frontier, observes that infrastructural investments can materialize the promise of developing 
uh, the promise of development, and here I'm quoting, slotting the landscape along a narrative of progress. In such narratives, so here Farrington, infrastructures often symbolize that which holds nature and culture apart, marking a temporal break between chaos and order. As if proving Heath Arrington's point, Pascal describes Poeta Castilla through the existence of basically two things, the port and the swamp, and with that through a vocabulary of either progress by the means of improved infrastructures or degradation through the forces of what he calls hostile environments. Marked by coastal wetlands, the environment around Puerto Castilla is one of mangroves and lagoons, periodically flooded grasslands, as well as lowland savannas. The coastal climate is tropical, with a rainy season from June to December. Most Hondurans only call the region the coast. Because of its mangrove landscape, Puerto Castilla is ideal for fishing, with shrimps providing the primary livelihood for the villagers. Calls to mangrove swamps are critical nursery grounds and refugia from predation for penai shrimp, spinny lobsters, and more than 200 species of fish. Because of its wet climate, these mangroves around Puerto Castilla are also an ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes, which is the aspect both Pascal but also the American traders choose to foreground when they speak of climate the improvement of humid health conditions, and also what they choose to foreground when trying to convince the Honduran National Port Authority of the scheme. According to Pascal, the area around Puerto Castilla had one of the highest malaria levels in the world, severely impacting the health of local fishermen, and with that, the economic progress and well-being of the region as such. This focus on mangroves, or rather the swamp, as he calls it, as refuge of a mosquito-borne disease, rather than as the habitat of the primary livelihood of the fishermen, thus turns the environment of Puerto Castilla, or its ecosystem, into a hostile environment that is impeding progress and development. Following this logic, the area's coastal wetlands needed to be, and I'm quoting um, again from and the letter eliminated and filled with incinerator ashes in order to improve human health conditions. And interestingly, this is a rhetoric that resonates with um, like, um, other sources throughout the Global South that I've read on, on similar schemes. And it's also like a rhetoric that resonates, um, for instance, with like what Indira Gandhi says in 1972 at the first UN conference um, for the environment in Stockholm, how poverty is um, the largest producer. And I think like another source of influence for that kind of thinking of like nature as impeding development um, also comes from this notion of wastelands um, and particular lands that are wasted if they're not used for infrastructures, um, which is particularly uh, important in the American context. And I think which is the source that influences the American waste traders to sell their deal and so forth. Throughout the letter, Pascal does mention his intention to guarantee that the waste material is harmless to the community. Yet he appears to be paying rather lip service to this idea while showing himself completely oblivious to the concept of environmental protection for mangrove ecosystems. The story of the proposal to use Philadelphia incinerator ash as landfill for wetland areas around the port of Puerto Castilla continues, and it marries this remote place in Honduras Atlantic coast, again with larger international protests for environmental protection led by Greenpeace. Um, yet as as this would lead us away from my story on environment and infrastructure, I'm, I'm stopping with the story here to summarize my points. So in the spring of 1987, the US American waste trader Coastal Cares approached a remote and impoverished community of Puerto Castilla with a scheme that packaged waste disposal with infrastructural development. And here, Puerto Castilla stands as past prototype for many other similar proposals brought before places that are structurally similar 
two Puerto Castilla, um, and that are located in the Caribbean, Central and Latin America, and also in West Africa. And as such, the proposal is both emblematic for the dynamics of the global waste economy, as a system built on inequalities and for a particular understanding of infrastructures coming at the cost of environmental exploitation and degradation for communities in the global south. The Honduran port village, um, and here we try to bring in like the long durée, the, um, the temporal scale. So the Honduran port village, Puerto Castilla, has a long history, starting with Spanish colonization of the area, that links the buildup of infrastructures with the foreign exploitation of its resources, be it tropical fruits, fish, or wood. The proposed to use Philadelphia incinerator ash as landfill material to stabilize wetlands into areas that could then be used um, for larger constructions, such as the expansion of the port or the building of roads, or in other words, the use of Honduran marshlands as disposal sites for used waste, is a continuation of that exploitative relationship once set up by the Spanish. Hondurans, in turn, found the deal still attractive because they connected infrastructures with a promise of development aiming at the reconnection of Puerto Castilla with global networks of commerce and trade. To achieve this kind of development, to achieve this kind of reconnection to um, the global, global networks, Hondurans also believed that infrastructures had to overcome hostile environments, such as the mangroves and marshlands around the port of Puerto Castilla. And finally, to return to the theme of this session, I think the story tells us the, the intersection of global and temporal scales um, that often come together in stool. Um, on the one hand, the story is exemplifying the globalization of waste and with that the globalization of particular environmental systems, such as like using waste as landfill material to reclaim or reclaim um, marshlands, and linking that like um, spatial scale with a temporal scale, I think is also very important because it links that globalization of those um, environmental systems with um, long durée practices of environmental racism. Um, thank you very much. Now let me introduce uh, our last speaker, Professor David Edgerton, who is Anser Rousing Professor of the History of Science and Technology at King's College London. And uh, among his books, I just want to recall The Shock of the Hold, Technology and Global History since 1900, originally published in 2006, last edition 2019, which was also a central text in our discussion when we decided to organize this event. And today the title of his presentation is Accumulation, Not Transition? Question mark. Some thoughts on the material history of the 20th century. Professor Edgerton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Giacomo. I'm, 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 I'm delighted to be uh, here with you, even if at a, a distance. My presentation today is going to be uh, a very uh, simple one. I'm going to make essentially uh, one argument, and that is that we have a very poor understanding of the material constitution of the world, in the past, um, and in uh, the, the present. I want to suggest that we uh, conceptualize um, the material world with very poor, very misleading models. Uh, these are of intellectual and political significance in that they shape our thinking and our actions, uh, but do so in ways which uh, detract from our ability to understand uh, uh, and to act um, uh, uh, well. It's difficult, I think, to, to uh, appreciate just how badly served we are by our models of the material constitution of uh, the world. Um, indeed, one of the central problems is that we believe these models uh, to be good representations of what is out 
And that's why we find them not only in political discourse, but in the work of economists, the work of historians of technology, um, the work of uh, global historians uh, as well. What are these uh, models? Well, they are particular kinds of stage theories of history. Uh, but they're also, and, and um, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Frézot, my, my, my former colleague and friend, was uh, uh, making this point uh, brilliantly um, uh, uh, this morning. They are arguments um, uh, expressed in the form of uh, statistical uh, shapes. And, th and these two, two kinds of approach, the, sh the stages and the shares, are at the core, I think, of our thinking about the materiality of the world. But today, I want to look at the notion of industrial revolutions, one of the most common ways in which uh, the, our topic is uh, uh, discussed. I may, um, uh, if time doesn't uh, uh, run too, too quickly, uh, have the opportunity to say something about the intellectual origins of, this, of these, these uh, conceptions, but my, my focus is on, on what they say and what they um, don't say. Let's start by looking at some of these theories. I've picked up some examples uh, from the, uh, the internet where they are uh, ubiquitous and often in, 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 um, in nice, simple uh, uh, forms, which, um, which will help um, demonstrate, I think, what is so wrong with them. Here's the first one. We have uh, the first industrial revolution in Europe and North America. Uh, all the other are not geographically uh, specified. A second industrial revolution of uh, 1870 to 1914, I get very typical. Uh, and then we have this extraordinary jump uh, to the 1980s to a third industrial revolution. A fourth is happening now. Uh, many people have believed this for the last uh, four or five years. And a fifth one is um, promised in this uh, account. And here is uh, another one, this one uh, without uh, dates, um, but uh, very uh, similar. Mechanization, water and steam power at the beginning. Uh, the second is a question of mass production, the assembly line and electricity. And the third, uh, the computer and uh, automation. And another one, uh, industry 1.0 to industry 4.0. Uh, first industrial revolution is um, uh, water and steam uh, power. And the second is uh, electricity and, um, and an assembly line. And the third, a bit earlier this time, uh, but also computers, uh, 1960s. And the fourth has the use of cyber physical systems. I have no idea what that is, but uh, perhaps somebody can enlighten us. Another version, phases of industrialization. Uh, and the final one I want to show you, uh, which is uh, focused on the fourth industrial revolution, which involves intelligence. Uh, the third was computing, the second was electricity, and the first was steam. And what I find particularly amusing about this one as a historian is that uh, steam is is, is is dated 1860 to 1820, but the locomotive that you see there is probably from uh, the 1920s rather than the 1820s or indeed even, even later than that. Uh, electricity is dated 1820 to 1930, but the picture is actually a, of a London power station which was built uh, uh, in the first half in the 1930s and the second in the 19. Um, in the 1940s. Now, uh, you might well be looking at these and, and saying to yourself, well, these are obviously uh, silly. Um, they are um, they are very schematic uh, uh, representations. And of course, you'd be absolutely uh, uh, right. But something like this is to be found right at the center of our understanding of uh, the modern uh, in particular. 
in in many different fields. We have it in the in in the in the form of these stories of industrial revolutions, or in the form of um, Kondratiev uh, waves or 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 techno uh, economic uh, systems. They are ubiquitous. Now, what is wrong with them? Well, it's not clear what they purport to be describing, but the most obvious reading is that they are telling us something about what might be called uh, technological frontier or the, the, the frontier of production, uh, the emergence of um, the most uh, advanced um, techniques in any particular historical um, uh, uh, period. And it's very striking then that that frontier of, of production or of, or, of, or of technology is uh, expressed in terms of, in this very last one I've got here, just one technique or one form of uh, energy. Um, uh, now that's worth uh, 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 noting, um, not, not because that is a, a, a sign of, of, of um, of, 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 of the fallaciousness of this approach, but because um, this is just an extreme version of what is standard in the best sort of works. You rarely get beyond three terms uh, to describe this, um, this technological or production uh, uh, frontiers. The trinity of technologies typically characterize each of these uh, ages. Now, what do we know about these um, these transformative uh, techniques? Well, um, they seem to be the same ones, mostly in these various uh, uh, different char characterizations, uh, but they're often different. And there's there's never any evidence uh, to support the assertion that this one, or rather than some other one, uh, is in fact uh, central. These are these are assertions which grow in authority with um, with repetition. So I want to suggest that even as descriptions of, as it were, a global frontier of production, these accounts are totally uh, inadequate. But that's just the beginning. Most production, most transformation of the material world does not take place at the technological or production um, frontier. Uh, it takes place, uh, uh, to use the image from, 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 from economists, a long way away from it. Growth, and I'll, I'll show this in a graph in a, in a, in a minute, um, uh, uh, most growth takes place, or at least the, large, the, the fastest growth, I should say, takes place in places which are furthest away from the uh, frontier. The consequence of this is that um, uh, as well as getting a particular uh, part of uh, uh, the world of material wrong, uh, they, they get the whole universe of the material even more wrong. Thirdly, uh, these are stage theories, uh, stage theories of a naivete that would make uh, a Stalin uh, uh, blush. They assume wholesale uh, or assert wholesale replacement of one technique by another, one world by another sort of world. Uh, we're talking here about radical discontinuities and uh, disruption. And yet, as uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste was so correctly uh, emphasizing, uh, we need to look at processes of uh, accumulation. Uh, I'll come back to that as well. Fourthly, um, the, these models clearly uh, uh, are, are very sim simple, you say simplistic, and uh, ignore the variety and complexity of the material world, including the world 
of uh, production. They have indeed uh, very little basis indeed in, um, it, uh, in empirical uh, reality. Uh, in fact, we really don't know what was produced when and how and what effect. We don't have a good idea of what uh, the technosphere uh, has been made up of in different historical uh, periods. Fifthly, it has a very, has a very narrow uh, conception of, um, well, um, industry, um, but industry is meant to stand for more than itself. It's to some extent meant to stand for society uh, as a whole, but whole areas of non-industrial uh, production on the farm, in the home, uh, in cases like construction, are simply eliminated um, uh, and indeed are usually implicitly treated as areas which have not been animated by the energizing forces of modern uh, industry. One might also ask, and this is my sixth point, uh, uh, where is the great acceleration in these models? Um, it is very striking that there is no great transition. I think in any of these model, the versions I've, I've shown you, um, uh, uh, in the 1940s or 1950s, and, and 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 I think that is that is true of I think pretty well all these models. So we have what many regard as the greatest transition in human uh, history, uh, completely ignored by um, these um, uh, these schema. Let's have a look at. Um, a graphical representation of GDP, GDP per uh, capita between 1870 and 2016. And it, it's very clear there that we have something that we've come to call the Great, uh, uh, the great Acceleration. Uh, it's a very clear uh, 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 break going on um, there. Here is uh, GDP per capita in the United States and the United Kingdom, um, but um, uh, on, on a logarithmic uh, curve. So we can see that in the case of the United Kingdom, uh, the rate of growth uh, steady in this period increases in the years after 1950. Uh, that is less true of the United States, but nevertheless, uh, there is uh, an acceleration. If we look at the world uh, more uh, broadly, again, uh, GDP per capita on a logarithmic uh, scale, we see the extraordinary increase in the rate of growth uh, compared to the, period, to the previous period here in poor countries. These are the places that are, um, are seeing uh, the greatest uh, great uh, a, a acceleration. Um, and, and of course, uh, we don't uh, um, believe that those places were themselves at the frontier of technical uh, development. And um, to come back to um, the question of what's old and what's uh, new, some of the most dramatic transformations in the 21st century uh, involve the explosion, uh, especially in uh, China, of the production of uh, materials, many other things that the standard models uh, associate with the 19th century. Uh, crude steel production in China, a small fraction of world production in 1996, uh, fully uh, half of world production uh, in uh, by 2013. A remarkable, uh, 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 unprecedented uh, transformation in, in the supply of uh, steel. 
one can't understand China without understanding the importance of steel at, at a global planetary level. Uh, case of coal uh, is a very uh, similar one. Uh, according to this graph, we've, we've uh, passed uh, peak coal, but very, very uh, recently, and the peak is uh, uh, driven by, um, uh, 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 mainly by uh, production in uh, China. Uh, um, uh, and of course, in, it, it perhaps needs to be uh, stated that uh, this, this really is the historical peak of coal production. It doesn't happen in 1900 or 1950, um, much less in the 19th uh, century. And uh, another example, uh, this is a graph which rather uh, beautifully uh, illustrates uh, global automobile production in, in millions of uh, units by country. And we can see, uh, uh, first of all, that automobile production uh, is increasing still at an extraordinary uh, rate, uh, very largely with Chinese um, uh, 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 um, uh, production. But essentially what we've seen is the accumulation of production in country after uh, 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 a country. There's very little fall in car production in any particular locality in um, in in the world. Uh, but uh, I, I, I ask you um, uh, to note that in our models of the transformations of the 21st century, cars and coal uh, and uh, and steel are are not especially uh, prominent. Let me turn now to this question of uh, shares. It's not just in, in the case of uh, energy that an analysis of transformation by focusing on, on, on shares is uh, central. Here is a, 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 a graph from McKinsey and Company, the management uh, uh, consultancy, which tells us this. History shows that technology has created large employment and sector shifts but also created new jobs. And it's about shares. It's about the collapsing share of agriculture, increasing share and then collapsing share of, um, of manufacturing, and of course, the increases in uh, services. It's a very, very standard image uh, applied um, to, uh, to, to the United Kingdom, to France, to, uh, to Italy, a, a replacement model, a, uh, a, uh, a transition uh, uh, model, as in the case of uh, energy. Uh, I want to um, show you how misleading these uh, can be by um, looking at the question of world agricultural uh, employment. If one looks for agricultural employment data, uh, what one finds again and again and again is data on the proportion of agricultural employment. Um, and for example, the, the World Bank uh, and the International Labour Organization have data showing that in 1991, the proportion of agricultural employment in total employment is not that easy to calculate at global level, was around 45%. By the end of the 20th century, it was down to 40. And by 2013, it was down to uh, 30%. But if one looks at, um, these numbers are difficult uh, to find, uh, uh, again, echoing uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, the absolute numbers, uh, the story looks very different. Uh, this is this is total world population, and this is it's not exactly agricultural population, um, but it's rural population. And you see that, that continues to uh, increase. And it's been overtaken now, um, but uh, the, the, the agricultural population of the world, or at least the rural population of the world, 
and it may well be the um, uh, uh, the agricultural population as well has uh, uh, increased. Indeed, from um, the uh, ILO World Bank uh, proportion uh, data, um, uh, it is clear that agricultural, um, uh, and I mean uh, I now do mean agricultural um, a worker uh, population uh, increased um, in into the 21st uh, century. Uh, and um, just to make uh, the point uh, about uh, energy, here's the standard uh, transition story, uh, very, very common one, exactly analogous to the employment story. Uh, and here is a different absolute story rather clearly. And here it is again, um, very clearly uh, in, in this image uh, showing that we are talking about a process of accumulation rather than a process of, um, of, of uh, transition. Um, I have, I think, a, a, a very few minutes uh, uh, left. So let, let me just say something about where uh, these these models uh, come from. So they do have a history, but the history um, that they have it is not one that is at all known to the people that generate these um, these images. Uh, they, these 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 accounts uh, of industrial revolutions are supposed to be history, rather than having a history uh, themselves. Now, what is particularly interesting is that right into the 1930s, at least in, 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 in the United Kingdom, lots of very serious uh, intellectuals, including economists like Alfred Marshall, did not think that the first industrial revolution uh, was a, a, a concept uh, worth holding on to. Uh, furthermore, um, uh, others uh, like Lewis Mumford, and he wasn't alone in this, uh, saw a, 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 a great transition, great material transition, I mean, taking place long before our modern first uh, industrial uh, revolution. So the closer you get to the, to the time, as it were, uh, the more doubt there is um, about the, uh, the, the, the existence of these uh, great uh, transitions. And the similar point can be made about um, the second industrial revolution. There is practically no sense of a second industrial revolution, uh, partly because there's no there's necessary sense of a first industrial revolution uh, in the 1880s, in the 1890s, um, in the period when it's supposedly uh, uh, happening. In the interwar years, however, you do get a sense of a contemporaneous second industrial revolution happening. And indeed, you get that same sense of a second industrial revolution happening in the 1950s and 1960s, meaning that that industrial revolution is happening in the 1950s and the 1960s. Now, that's very different from the conception uh, that was reproduced in those uh, images I showed earlier. So where does our, our modern and now absolutely standard second industrial revolution come from? Well, there's a little sketch of it in the work of uh, Patrick Geddes. But I think the first um, uh, uh, well um, uh, uh, um, uh, evidenced notion of the second industrial uh, revolution as we understand it today uh, is due to Georges Friedman uh, in French in 1936. That uh, argument has no impact whatsoever in the Anglophone uh, world. In, in this world, uh, the historian uh, Geoffrey Barraclough is, I think, the inventor of our modern sense of the Second Industrial Revolution, and he's followed, um, though he doesn't acknowledge uh, this, uh, by David Landis uh, in the late 1960s in his 
unbound uh, Prometheus. What is remarkable is that this notion of the second industrial revolution gets deeply wired in uh, to our understanding. It is, for example, absolutely central uh, to the work of Alfred Chandler. And indeed, one would be hard pushed uh, to pick up a, a book of economic history or history of technology or history of science that does not have some notion of the second uh, industrial uh, revolution. On top of this, uh, since the 1970s in, in, in particular, uh, through new forms of economics of, uh, of innovation, uh, there's been a, a vogue for uh, technological chondriatia cycles, long waves, a 50 year uh, duration, constant, uh, a, a constant period. Uh, unlike the, the diagrams which we have we've seen, which which have had uh, shortening periods between uh, industrial uh, industrial uh, revolutions. So there is a there is a there is a a, a, a history to be uh, to be written about all this, um, but the fundamental point uh, remains that the relationship between material reality and these models is extraordinarily uh, weak. But despite this, uh, these models uh, have achieved uh, remarkable uh, academic uh, as well as uh, political uh, authority. So to conclude, we have in our academic uh, world a, a profound lack of understanding of the material constitution of our world. Um, in the case of energy, much uh, uh, um, in much else uh, besides. We really do need to break out of what many take to be a common sense, realistic um, uh, view. Uh, but that standard common sense view is uh, intellectually and politically dangerous. Uh, we need to get rid of it and we need to appreciate at the same time uh, the extent of our collective ignorance. Uh, thank you very much.